thank you very much for coming along. Right, so I'm Paula Carnell, and um, thank you for coming along for my talk on naturopathic beekeeping. It's good to see some familiar faces. Um, so, I love this quote. Those who know how to treat the bees need not fear the sting. Now I'm sure many of us in here have been stung by bees and wouldn't it be lovely if we can work with bees without being stung. So the more deeper you look into these quotes, it's, it's really interesting and it can change your perspective. We can take for granted that we're gonna be stung all the time. But I did hear that the average amount of stings you should have a year is four. And four stings will prevent you from having an anaphylaxis reaction later on. Um, so if you have fewer or if you have more, you're more likely to become more allergic to stings. So four a year is a lovely medicinal amount to have. So have that as your, your goal. So who am I? So I'm Paula Carnell and I'm a naturopathic beekeeper. Um, I've got my bee team and I've got Kerry and Randy are here today and Emma who does my social media. So those of you who follow social media, <laughs> Emma's the girl who does it all, so I can't do everything. Um, so, and then I've got Linda as well and Joe. And Joe Bleasdale's a very well respected beekeeper. He's been keeping bees about 45 years. Um, so he's great and he's written books a lot about no fuss, no chemicals with beekeeping and worry top bar keeping. So obviously I highly respect Joe and all of my team. We've all got our own bees and we've all been keeping bees. I think between us now we're on about um, 75 years of beekeeping experience. So, um, so we've got a bit of practice under our belts. Um, so we work with all kinds of different hives and I notice on the, the information about um, what I do is we are actually the beekeepers for the Newton Somerset. So how many of you have been to the Newton Somerset? <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. Um, so I was really lucky. I got an opportunity and went for it in 2017. And the Newt is a large historic estate and it was bought by new owners um, in about 2013, 2014. And they planted a lot of orchards. And the owner happened to find me and just said, I planted some orchards, I'd like to have some bees. And so I was invited to have a look around. So I had a look around. Now, if I was a conventional beekeeper, what I could have done is buy a hundred hives and then buy in a hundred packets of bees and we'd have a honey factory. But I saw this as a real opportunity for change. And the owners are very interested in education. And they'd he heard me speak and they just wanted to have something that was a bit different. So I went away and I wrote a program for the bees. And having had my own business um, for I mean, I've been self-employed since I was 20 years old, so getting on a bit now. And I know that people want a return on investment. So we're all aware that if you put your bees on somewhere, they either want the honey um, or you've got to pay them to put your, your bees there. So I needed to think of a way that I could make it beneficial for them to be um, conserving the bees. But the key thing, which I know is quite relevant with this whole event, with the conversations that are going on, is it's being aware of what and who are the actual pollinators. We tend to think, or the public tend to think, that we've got one bee and it's the honeybee, and the honeybee does everything. But in actual fact, there's 22,000 species of bees around the world. 11 of them are honeybees. Here in the UK, we have 270 species of bees, and only one of them is a honeybee. Now, at the Newt Estate, because they've got all these cider apple trees, the bee they want is the red mason bee. And if I was to buy in colonies of bees, you're adding 50,000 hungry mouths for each of those colonies of bees. And what's happening all around the world is the honeybees are starving out. They're eating all the food that the other bees need. Now, here's a really interesting statistic. One red mason bee does the pollination work of 250 honeybees. Now in the Sichuan province in China, they've actually got to the stage where 45 years ago, the environment was so toxic that they lost all their native bees. And then it was so damaging that even the honeybee keepers wouldn't put their bees on the land. And the government tested the land and said it would be 50 years 
before it would be um, non-toxic enough to put bees on that land. Now that was if they had stopped using chemicals and they not stopped using chemicals. So now people have to pollinate by hand the pears and the apples. It takes 25 people to do the pollination work of one honeybee. 250 honeybees to do the pollination work of one red mason bee. So this is the situation we've got. But I am not all about not taking honey or not having bees but I am very interested in educating the public and educating beekeepers on how we can work together with the bees and our environment in a sustainable way. So I was very lucky as well. Part of my plan was I wanted to have um, an education room or a museum or um, a building that was for bees. And so they put together the Byzantium. And I worked with the, um, with the architects and with some um, design outfitters, museum outfitters in Holland. And we put together the Byzantium and we've got four observation hives in that building. And um, I won't talk about it today, but I work with all kinds of interesting energies and, and things to know that where I'm putting my bees, it's gonna be good for the bees. But that's a whole other talk. So we have the Byzantium and yesterday we got the figures that we only opened in July last year and we've had over 10,000 people have visited that Byzantium since July last year. Now in addition to that, Kerry, Joe and I, we actually do daily or five days a week, we do bee safaris. So we take people on walks around the gardens, we point out where the different bees would be living, the right sort of habitat. We also talk to them about honeybees and we explain what we're doing differently with our bees. So when I first went there in 2017, there were two colonies on the estate. One was wild living in a linden tree, lime tree, and one was a wild swarm that had flown straight into an empty hive. So we didn't buy any bees. What we did was we set up bait hives and we split colonies as we've grown. So this May, we will have been there five years and we've now got between 15 and 20 colonies. So I'm lucky to count the exact numbers. So it goes up a bit in the summer, down a bit at the end of summer, autumn. But we're not losing bees. Every year we're getting an increase. Now the key thing is we're beekeeping naturopathically. So we have a variety high of hives. We have WBC, we have Worry, we have Golden Hives and we have the Freedom Hives. And we've also got wild colonies in trees. So in the middle there, there's a bait hive for a golden hive, and then we've got a freedom hive. So some of you may be aware of Matt Somerville, who's a brilliant log hive and um, hive designer. So he designs the freedom hives and also the golden hives. So we've worked quite closely with him, and not just at the Newt, but with some of our other clients as well. So as we all know, the bees don't read the books. So I'm gonna show you couple of things that you may have heard don't happen. So one of the great things is that bees aren't interested in daffodils. And here we are, it's quite a windy day and I had shaky hands so I apologise for that. Um, but here we have a honeybee collecting nectar from a daffodil. And I think what really inspires me is what you can learn from observing the bees. So it really is learning from the bees you see the pollen on her back. And this is why they're not effective pollinators. If that was a red mason bee, she'd be covered in pollen because they have the hairier bodies, which I'm sure you all know, so give me that. <laughs> so there we go, going back for more. So the question is, do they go for that because there was nothing else or do they get some kind of benefit? And then here's another video just after the Byzantium opened, we put in two colonies, which we had split from our existing colonies. And one was in a golden hive. So um, her mother was Druid. And then this is the daughter of um, Winifred, one of our other colonies in a WBC hive. So we actually split the colony and then we put, we had an observation hive made. So it's three frames deep. Um, and we've got two, su two supers and two brood. So the, the idea is that all the bees in our observation hives can live there throughout the year. And so at this point, they've all made it through so far. But what we've got is a bee grooming. And the amount of times I've been told that bees don't groom and that's a load of rubbish. I have observed so many bees grooming each other. 
but you've got to enable them to grow. So we all know bees are the key to saving the planet, um, but is beekeeping the best way? I'm sure you've all had people come up to you and go, oh yeah, I'm really worried about bees, I want to save the bees, so I'm going to get a beehive. That is quite possibly the worst thing you can do. But if you're educated and if you think about it and you consider what you're doing and you don't do it as a self selfish act, you're actually considering your environment and what you're doing with the bees, then it can be a very beneficial thing to do. And as I'm sure you've all found that once you start keeping bees, you gain a much greater interest in nature as a whole and your environment. You're much more conscious if your neighbours are spraying their garden or the farmer's doing some spraying or if you've got other bees on your plants, your garden changes. Perhaps, I hope, you start to love your dandelions. So Peter Neumann, <laughs> um, has anybody seen him speak? He's an absolutely amazing speaker. Um, and he's been president of Colos for a number of years, very engaging. And he starts his talks with saying, the biggest risk to bees is beekeepers. And so the question is why? Now, here's, this is what we are often greeted with when we open our hives. Lovely, calm, natural bees, lots of propolis, but very calm. So it's taken us a while to get to that stage, but something, I mean, you might all get asked when you, um, when you meet somebody who doesn't keep bees, it's like, oh, how often do you get stung? So stinging often is that sort of guideline of, you know, either how dangerous beekeeping is and therefore how brave you are, or how skilled you are that you can take the honey without being stung. And I'm pleased to say that the last four years we've been taking honey and we've been using a very woo-woo spiritual method, but it works. And even Joe, with all his years of experience, who thought it was polite to give the bees a little smoke before we open it up, we now don't use any smoke, we don't use queen excluders, we don't do clearing boards, we just work with the bees in their natural cycles and the last four or five harvests none of us have been stung during the honey harvest we get stung if we're moving bees we get stung if we do something stupid but um generally we don't so what is naturopathy it's one of those words that you hear bandied about but it's not often discussed about exactly what naturopathy is and it is using the healing force of nature so before you get into naturopathy, you have to come to that understanding that there is a life force. And I'm sure if you've worked with bees, you've noticed that you have different colonies. Some of them have temperaments. Some of them are very different than others. Now, if we were to think that they were inanimate objects, they were not living beings, they wouldn't have their characters, they wouldn't have their personalities. Now, if they have a life force, we have the duty to enable them to allow that life force to keep them well. And so the nature force, the force of nature is always to have balance and always to have well-being. But you have to have the environment to allow that. So it's not a simple thing, it's not one thing. And there's another, um, I'm not sure if that will play yet, another little video. Now this is interesting because this was a colony called Grace and this is a week before we harvested honey. And we were a bit late that year, so it was the beginning of August. And what I noticed was the hives were full. They had three, four, five supers. This is about 20, 2019, just before we had to move them. And um, they all started grooming. And I had read a paper where when the bees are left their honey, they then relax and they spend the autumn months grooming each other because they've got time to groom. If all the honey's been taken off, they go into this real state of stress and they're desperately trying to find something to forage from to replenish their nectar sources and to replenish their honey. Because their honey is their nutrition, it's their food. And without the honey, to just have sugar is, is not good. So I'm just going to do a quick run through. The difference between conventional, conventional beekeeping tends to be all about the honey. There can be treatments, chemical treatments, mitocides, antibiotics, queen wing clipping, drone culling, disease prevention cures, so that's the mitocides, and the habitat, the type of hives that we put bees in, is very much geared up for honey extraction and human convenience. So the naturopathic, it's not just about the honey. And I don't know about you, but I'm getting more and more people coming to me who want to keep bees, but it's not about the honey. They just feel they want to help the bees. They're drawn to them, they have a calling. 
but they don't know what the options are. They don't know how to do whatever they want to do. So you can have treatment free, B gyms. Who here has used B gyms? Yeah, brilliant. Wonderful things. How have you found? When I first started using B gyms 11 years ago, um, I had them in the bottom of WBC hive, so I couldn't really see what was happening, but I'd made the decision to be treatment free. Um, about five or six years ago, um, we had some worry hives. I bought some colonies from other people and, um, you know, retired and, and stuff, so I got their bees. And I couldn't put um, a bee gym inside the hive because it was all sealed up with propolis and, you know, established colonies. So I put bee gyms underneath the entrance outside the hive and I actually found bees would come out the hive and go round, have a good scratch and itch on the bee gym and then go back inside. So, <laughs> and you know, and this is the thing, you need to be watching and, and learning. So it's the observation and prevention rather than cure. We all know about disease, you know, the last couple of years has taught us more than anything about how we need to try and keep ourselves healthy because trying to cure yourself when you're sick is a lot harder. So, I'll give you a little bit of a history about why I keep bees. Um, I used to be an artist. I had a 20-year career, 22-year career as an artist. I exhibited all around the world. I had a publishing business, had greeting cards. Um, I used to come up to the NEC here and exhibit at the trade fairs. Um, but I'm a Dorset girl, and so I was forced to read and know a lot about Thomas Hardy. But thankfully, I really loved the Julie Christie character in Far From The Madding Crowd. Um, and there's a scene in there where she's a, this very fiercely independent woman and she's climbing a tree and catching a swarm with a, um, a straw skep. And she had a lovely white flowing dress and a lovely big hat and the net. And I just thought, oh, that would be nice. So it was always on my list. One day I'll be a beekeeper just like her. Um, but what happened was when I hit 40 years of age, I completely collapsed. And I spent the next seven years bed and wheelchair bound and after six years, it was diagnosed as Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome. So I was told I'd never walk again, never work again, and I wouldn't make it to 50. So it was a case of I could take the antidepressants, I could have um, painkillers, but I'd made the decision that I wouldn't do that because I'd spent the six years before I had my diagnosis trying to find out what was going on in my body. And I found a medical herbalist who happened to move into my town, Castle Perry. So as soon as I had the diagnosis, I became her patient. And within eight months, she had me out in the wheelchair. I was a very good patient. I did everything she said, and I took all the medications that she recommended. And before I had my diagnosis, about a year and a half in, my husband bought me a beehive because I was stuck in bed, couldn't do much, and my birthday kept coming round, and it was like, what do you want for your birthday? I couldn't go anywhere, couldn't have anybody round. And so um, I just said, I really want a beehive. My husband thought I was mad, how can you have a beehive when you haven't got bees? How can you have bees and a beehive if you can't get out of bed? But I just felt if I had a hive, the bees would come. It was a very strong calling. And of course, because of Bathsheba Everdeen and my romantic vision, I had a WBC hive. Little was I to know just how important that hive has been and how influential that is on my beekeeping practice, because it's all about insulation. So this is my mentor. So I had a hive, and then in my book A to B's, if any of you have read that, there's a story about how I met my mentor, which is, again, a really interesting story. Um, and this is him with my first swarm after my colony had swarmed. But the big shock for me was he was teaching me everything about beekeeping, very gentle, very um, calm, you know, and he was telling me what he was doing, and he'd come up every week. When I was well enough, I'd get out of bed and I'd sort of be propped up near the hive and be taught about beekeeping. But the big shock for me was after our first honey harvest and we got 140 pounds of honey from that WBC hive. I didn't know if that was good or bad. Now I know that was blimmin' extraordinary. But um, so we split it, we had 70 jars each and I was very excited that I'd have jars for all my friends and family for Christmas. And. Um, so that was really exciting. And then the next time he came, he had this big block of fondant. And I was like, what are you doing? And he said, well, we've got to feed the bees. We've taken all their honey. And I was devastated. I just 
couldn't believe what we were doing. Now, even at that early stage of my condition, I knew that I could not eat honey. I knew how um, I could not eat sugar. I knew how toxic sugar was to the body. So, now, my mum also introduced me, after I was at the wheelchair, she introduced me to plant-based minerals. Now, we all know we need vitamins and minerals, but we don't really know why or how or anything like that. So mum found me these um, supplements, plant-based minerals. So I was out of the wheelchair, I was still fairly disabled, I didn't think I'd be able to work again, and my mum said, try these minerals. Within two weeks, I didn't need walking sticks, and within three months, I walked the Dorset coast from Weymouth to Swanage in a couple of days. And, it was, and that was me challenging, because I thought, I feel better, I'm wanting to do things, but I've been told I'll never walk again and I shouldn't be well. So, me being me, I thought, well, if I can walk the Dorset coast, then I must be well. So I made my husband do it as well with me and made him take the minerals, so I wasn't going to have him stopping halfway through with a dodgy knee. You know, we had to do it. <laughs> but it was through the minerals that I then realised about nutrition for human food. So in 1946, 47, if you had a plate of salad, you would have a certain amount of um, nutrition. Can anyone guess how many plates of salad you need to have now to have the same amount of nutrition? Four times the amount? Okay. Any bigger numbers? <laughs> Forty-seven times, and that was actually um, the study was done. I think 2017, and the reason is that our soil is depleted. So around the world, it's an averaging of about 75% depleted in minerals, um, and in parts of the United States, it's 99% depleted of minerals. So the food we're getting is grown in mineral deficient soil. Now this is important because it made me realise that if our soil is deficient, the bees aren't getting any nutrition in the nectar. If it's not in our food, it's not in the nectar. So I started to think, I knew that sugar wasn't right for bees, but I didn't know how to explain it. And when I was first well and able to go to bee groups, I remember saying to this bee group, we've got to stop feeding sugar. And I had this wise old chairman with a long flowing beard, tell me how silly I was because everyone knew that sugar and honey were exactly the same and I didn't have the knowledge to explain why I knew it wasn't and very few of us do we just have we work on our instinct or our intuition and the rest of it we just do as we're told so that put me on a real quest to find out why there was a difference between honey and sugar and crazily only this year you know like eight nine years in I've suddenly thought if honey and sugar were the same, why do we go to so much trouble to steal all the honey from the bees? You know, we'd just eat the sugar. So I started to give my bees the minerals, the same powdered minerals I was having, and my bees were getting stronger and healthier. And people are losing bees, and I'm not losing bees. People are having varroa, I'm not having a problem with varroa. And my bees were grooming. So instead of using icing sugar, sprinkling in the hive, I would sprinkle a bit of the minerals, and they would just scratch that off, and they'd be fine. Um, I do have a video of them eating that, but the first time I put it out, you have the odd bee coming out, drinking, eating a bit, and then going in. Within half an hour, it was all gone. So now I treat all the colonies I look after. I do just about that much minerals once a year, and that's all they need for each hive, and that's enough to give them the nutrients they need. So I needed to find the difference between sugar and honey. So I started to study in Bologna as a honey sensory analyst. Has anybody else done the courses there? You haven't done it? Nobody? I know there's more and more beekeepers and honey producers who've gone down there. Um, they started doing the course in English in 2017. And that has a big impact as well on honey and the sales of honey around the world because the Italian register of honey sensory analysis, they wrote the description and the definition of honey, which means that in Europe, Britain, and America, you can only have honey from the species Apis mellifera. Uh, mellifera. And there's actually 10 other honeybee species around the world. So this is one of the problems we have with honey fraud, is that you have honey produced by Apis varia, Apis dorsata, you know, the giant Asian honeybees, Apis um, serrana, 
and there's no market for their honey. And so you'll have honey corruption, fraudulent, fraudulent people buying honey from these producers where it's really ethically, sustainably produced from small communities and they're diluting it down and selling it as honey. So this is another angle of the, the honey fraud. So what's great about this course is now more and more people from around the world have done it. The Italians are now more conscious of the fact that there are other honeybee species and we need to widen the scope of, of honeybees. So honey actually has 180 different compounds in it. And this is the official definition. So it's a sweet substance produced by Apis mellifera. And it also allows for the honeydew honey. Now what's amazing about honey and why it's so different is that because the bees have already processed it, it goes straight to the brain. So if you have sugar, it goes into your body, it goes down to the liver and the liver's got to process it so that we can absorb it. So when you wake up in the middle of the night, it's because your brain is starved of food and it wakes you up so you can kickstart your liver to process more sugar. So then you can have more fuel. If you have a spoonful of honey before bed, it's enough fuel to keep your brain going all night so you can sleep through the night. Now that's also, you've got all the mineral minerals and vitamins in there. There's just so much goodness. And this is what the bees need. So if you start off by giving the bees good nutrition, they're much more able to defend themselves against disease and illness. So sugar, it's acidic, it's addictive, it's the same as cocaine, it affects mood, it <laughs> creates inflammation. Now, how many of you would feed your partners, your children, your grandchildren, white sugar from August through to March or April. I mean, you knew that if you did it, they'd be as sick as anything, wouldn't they? So why would we do it to wild animals who've not even adapted to have a processed food? It just doesn't make any sense. I know that we have this dilemma of, oh, if we don't feed them, they'll die. So leave them the honey. You know, and yes, you will lose some colonies, but we cannot have an environment where weak colonies are being propped up by chemicals and sugar. It just doesn't do any good. And it, you know, I know there can be loads of debates about this, so I won't go into it anymore, but this, this is my opinion and my experience, that if you stop feeding them sugar, you start having more healthy bees. We even had a point where we would have swarms, and you know when a swarm moves into a hive and then the weather changes, you've got two weeks of rain, and you think, oh, crikey, they're gonna die. And then we've given them some fondant or some sugar, thinking, well, at least they can make the wax comb. We find they die anyway in November, December. They're just not strong colonies. Could it also be that that swarm, where they're being fed all year round, they've swarmed and not filled their stomachs with honey. They're not prepared to make the wax comb when they get to a new home. You know, these are all these things that need to be researched and looked at. You know, if we are feeding bees all the time, and I know every week I get an email from my bee group saying, oh, there's more sugar from Tesco's, rubbed off their donuts, it's all ready for your beekeepers. You know, got plenty of food for your bees through the summer. But what they need is plants, and they need nutritious plants. So the dandelion, I mean, it's so powerful with nutrients. It's absolutely incredible plant. This is what the bees need, not sugar. So the Welsh Botanic Gardens, they did a study on what plants in their gardens the bees favoured for the honey. Now they've got 8,000 species of plants, and when they got the results back, the bees favoured 11 species. It was alder, ash, um, willow, hazel, hawthorn, blackthorn, bramble, dandelions, clover. It was all the weeds. It was everything growing outside of the botanic gardens. So why would this be? It's because the bees know where the nutrition is. Now, with a dandelion, it has these really deep tap roots that go down and break up the metallic minerals deep in the soil. They process it into a more absorbable form. So into this, um, the potassium and calcium. So if you eat the leaves, you're gonna get your calcium and potassium. If you leave the leaves, those minerals have been brought from deep down to the surface. Now, the amazing thing with dandelions are that the seed heads, when the wind takes the seed heads and they will carry for up to 60 miles, you can't blame your neighbors or they can't blame you, <laughs> 60 miles they'll fly. They'll only take root in soil that needs calcium and potassium. Now that's just the dandelion. Now since the medical herbs really helped fix me, I've been studying, so I'm six years into sort of a eight year course to be a medical herbalist. 
And so we're still learning, and I'm still learning, about the different mineral properties of all the different herbs. But they are rich in minerals, and the bees already know. They already know where to get their food. Coriander. Now, um, I love this from traveling around and meeting lots of beekeepers. You get these little snippets of stories. And I went to Apple Mondia in 2019 in Canada and went to visit some beekeepers sort of in rural Quebec. And they were growing a lot of coriander. And there's researchers in New Zealand who find that the bees that feed on coriander are more resistant to varroa. Now, if you eat or smell coriander honey, it smells of crushed bugs. When I was studying in Italy, the main description for coriander honey was chimiche and it smells like a stinky bug that they crush. <laughs> Could it be that when bees have got coriander honey in their hive, it smells of crushed bugs and the varroa think, crikey, these are violent bugs, they're going to bite our legs off. You know, <laughs> could it be? We don't know. But then you look back and what we used to do was we used to plume our hives. You know, we used to use sort of cow dung. You know, um, bees in Vietnam, they use chicken dung to protect themselves against um, the Asian hornets. So there's all these things we need to learn about scent and aroma that are really important inside the hive. So I travelled to Oman um, and met beekeepers there because I wanted to find where are the bees healthy? Where are the people healthy? Where are the bees healthy? In Oman, the Sultan has declared no more chemical agriculture. So the bees are foraging on wild um, crops all across the mountains, but also agricultural crops that have not been treated with chemicals. Now you'd think, desert, mountains, how much honey would you get over there? They have gallons of it, gallons of it. But also, it's a really strong, faith-rich country. And in Islam, um, in the Quran, there's a whole chapter called the Bee. And it's a really special chapter. And there's a verse in there that says, take um, put the hives in the mountains in the trees and then from their bellies emerges a fluid of diverse colors that is healing for the people surely in this is a sign for those who reflect so these people know that honey is medicine so they value the honey so a jar of honey that you could buy here for five pounds you'd buy for 30 pounds in Oman but that's normal and they respect it and they treat it as a medicine they're not just drizzling it on their toast <laughs> So it's having that understanding of, of what do we want from honey? And if we are trying to earn a living or we're trying to sell the honey, we need to start respecting it more. I then also went to Bhutan, where um, the beekeepers there in the south of Bhutan, they have honey houses. So they've been living with bees. And this is one of the inspirations for the Byzantium at the Nude, was to have the bees in close proximity. But again, you've got children, you've got people living with bees, they're not being stung and they'll have up to 11 colonies around their house through the summer months. So it's amazing. But in Bhutan, the king of Bhutan, no chemicals. It's the first organic agricultural country in the world, or even, you know, the only, completely organic. So again, you've got healthy bees. When I asked the beekeepers there, there's a beekeeping association, I got to meet um, the government officials and talk to them. And um, I said, you know, what's your losses? How many bees do you lose each year? And they sort of looked at each other and then there was a bit of chitter chatter in, in Bhutanese. And then they went, oh yes, somebody lost a, a hive a couple of years ago due to a tiger. <laughs> you know, so they're not saying, oh yeah, we've got to lose 40%, 30%. They're not losing bees because they're looking after them. So I also went to South Africa and um, I, the, the Newt actually has a sister hotel in South Africa called Babylon Storm. And I actually got to see pseudo scorpions. Who here has heard of pseudo scorpions? Really exciting. Pseudo scorpions, guess what their main diet is? Varroa. Varroa. Mm -hmm. And we used to have them. We used to have them in Britain before we had mesh floors. So the pseudo scorpions like to live in a sort of the crud that you'd get at the bottom of a hive. You also find them living in straw with um, chickens or pigs. So in Babylon Storm, they have solid floor hives and they have um, pseudo scorpions. Now, the interesting thing is, when I've been talking to, to people here about how exciting that is, science <coughs> is breeding pseudo scorpions, thinking, great, we'll send people packets of pseudo scorpions so they can put them in their hive and they'll eat all the varomite. Problem is, pseudo scorpions are actually um, um, cannibals. 
So you buy a packet of 10, but you receive one. <laughs> but why don't we create the environment and then they will appear? Nature has this incredible way of doing that. So the other interesting thing over in Babylon Star and was all the propolis. The bees, Apis capensis, they were great propolis makers. So the hives were full of propolis. I don't know if you can see that, but the entrance completely blocked up with just bee-sized holes. So propolis is, um, it just has the most incredible properties. It's antibiotic, it's antiseptic, it's anti-inflammatory, antifungal, antioxidant, um, antiviral, and anti, um, I've got antifungal. Now this is some propolis inside one of our golden hives, after we've moved the colony out into a bigger hive. And what they do is they put the propolis on the entrance of the door and they use it like a curtain so they can open and shut it so they can reduce the size of the entrance and yet bees are bred not to produce propolis now there's been so much research about bees that live in the wild who are in propolis envelopes so that they are completely protected now again this is where we need a different perspective we look at a bee as an individual but it's a super organism 50,000 bees is one being and their skin is the propolis so they need the propolis but our hives they're smooth on the inside so the bees can't attach propolis they really need it so we need to start ruffling up the inside of our hives and enabling the bees to make propolis yes it sticks everything together but if you don't want to take so much honey start harvesting your propolis you can sell that for a lot more because it's so medicinal you can make your tinctures and it's an amazing amazing product so start thinking differently if you're trying to get your money back from all that you've invested in your beehive. So Dr. Spivak, Spivak she's done incredible research on um, propolis, and they actually found that when they injected the spores of um, when they injected the spores of American <coughs> fowl brood into the hive, that the bees with propolis didn't get sick. Now isn't that incredible? So the bees already know how to be well, but they just need to stop us interfering. So here's a big lump of propolis. This is actually from Cocos Keeling Islands. At the beginning of 2020, I was lucky to be there. Um, and you might think I'm all natural and always want wooden hives, but trees are great feeders for bees. You need an acre of flowering plants for each colony of bees. An ancient tree can have an acre's worth of blossom on it, so we need the old trees. So I now feel bad about cutting down these beautiful cedar trees, which we, do, we know make lovely hives. I was approached by the, um, the owner of Appy May Hives a few years ago. We were judging together, and he said, oh, would you like to see my hives? They're plastic. And I'm like, oh, no, I don't want plastic hives. But then when I was on Cocos Keeling, it's in the tropics. It's in the middle of the Indian Ocean. I mean, literally in the middle of the Indian Ocean. And because they have to ship things there, if they ship wooden hives, it costs them a fortune, and they rot within a couple of years because it's so humid. These plastic hives last forever, as we know, and they were just brilliant and great insulation. So it's opening your minds. Just because I'm natu naturopathic doesn't mean that I can't use modern technology or modern ideas or modern materials. So here we go. I love this. This is one of the freedom hives, and this is after about four weeks after a swarm had moved in. No foundation, no um, sticks or anything. They just made their own comb. But what I love is you see the propolis going round. So as the comb comes down, they start to coat the propolis around where they're living. So I know that all the beekeepers love their bees, but these are some of the really stressful practices. So smoke, I remember asking my, um, my mentor, you know, what does smoke actually do? And he said, oh, it calms the bees. And I'm like, well, how exactly does it calm the bees? And he said, well, they go down into the hive and they fill their stomachs up with honey because they think their hive's on fire. Now, to me, that is a fight or flight or a stress response. It's not calming. The other reason you'd use smoke, just in case you didn't know, is that when you get stung, it releases a pheromone that smells like bananas. And so you use smoke to mask that smell because once they smell that, you're gonna get all of them coming to attack you because they're under threat. So in Oman, they'll use smoke, but they'll use it as a medicinal treatment and they will put medicinal herbs in a smoker and you'll have a row of 10 hives and they'll go puff like that. 
It's not a bit puff, 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 puff. You know, I've seen beekeepers do it and it's just, it's habit. But we need to step away because you don't need to do that. How would you be if you thought your house was on fire? You would not be calm. Feeding Sugar, in Canada, visiting another one of the big um, organisations, I saw these big tankers outside and I just said, gosh, all those tankers. And they said, oh yeah, that's only half of them. And I was like, oh gosh, is that all your honey? No, that's the sugar. That's the sugar they have to buy in to feed their bees. That's madness. And this is one of those things that you think, if the public knew that bees are fed sugar, and I know this, when we do our bee safaris, when we're in the Byzantium, the public think that we don't feed our bees sugar, that we wouldn't use chemicals inside a hive. These are dirty secrets. And I think we need to sort of open up. We need to be transparent about how we're handling our bees. If you thought about your other food production, you know, if you knew that your other food was tainted with different materials, would you be happy? Chemical treatments. How many years have we been using chemical treatments for Varroa? Have we still got Varroa? So the thymol and mitocides, there's so many um, research studies now that are showing the effects. And we're seeing this as well now, where you'll have a queen, she'll, you'll have the, a colony, we'll make a new queen, she'll go off, she'll get mated. A couple of weeks later, they're trying to requeen again because she's mating with infertile drones. So the second generation of drones from a colony that's been treated with thymol, they're infertile. And you can find that Kerry here, if you want to know how to tickle drones, she's an amazing drone tickler. <laughs> and so she can test <laughs> how, how good they are with their, um, you know, how, how fertile they are. And this is a real problem, you know, a real problem. It's only drones she tickles. <laughs> um, so I'm not saying we should go back to this sort of beekeeping but how do we keep them sustainably so I have to include this one of my heroes so Tom Seeley he always says that you know if the colonies are producing drones and if they're swarming it's a sign that they are healthy this is their natural way of reproduction they need to be able to swarm and he says the Darwinian beekeeping tells us that everything that colonies do when they're living on their own is done to favour their survival. So everything a bee does is for the survival and the best of the species. We could really learn from that. How much that we do, particularly with our beekeeping, is for the benefit of either the species or for our environment. It's more often than not, it's a selfish behaviour. There's another lovely quote, which is, when bees see food, they dance more. When humans see food, they eat more. So hives and insulation. I don't know if any of you saw um, Torben Schiffer's talk last year at the Honey Show, where he was talking about insulation. If you haven't seen it, look it up. It's absolutely brilliant. Um, and I go into it in more detail on my, um, my courses. Swarming, so important. The bees know when they need to swarm. Obviously, if you're in an environment, if you're in a city, you need to do some kind of management. But you can have balance management. You can be educating your neighbours, you can be educating the public, but you can also be setting up bait hives or you can be doing splits. But please, you know, do we really have to be clipping wings? And this is a swarm in my back garden and I actually had two queens in one swarm. So again, we're still learning. It's not necessarily so that the queen, first queen that hatches kills all the other queens. That would not be for the best interest of the bees. Because if that queen is eaten by a bird when she mates, or if she's mated with infertile drones, that colony will die out. So we've experienced, and I've met beekeepers who've seen more than one queen in a colony. So it's really opening your mind and observing, not just doing what you think is being told much less manipulation. It takes 10 days after you've opened a hive for the colony to re-establish um, not only its temperature, but also the, the scents, the smells. So, you know, 10 days. If you're opening up your hive every week, they're living in a constant state of stress. Minimal transportation, again, that's stressful. The big pollination, you know, in America where the bees are transported all around to pollinate the almonds and the blueberries, 
they lose 40% of the bees. But they're only having to use honeybees because the environment is too toxic for the 4,000 species of um, solitary and bumblebees that should be doing the pollination. So we're becoming dependent on the honeybee, but the honeybee's role is to make honey and it's to produce medicine for the people. It's not for pollination. The pollination is an inefficient byproduct of honeybees. So it's only taking some of the honey. It's working with your bees. It's making sure that they've got enough honey. And if you want to know how we do it without being stung, then you have to do one of my courses or watch my YouTubes and things. So there's different things you can use instead of smoke. Um, if we are doing some difficult work or if we're taking bees out of a roof or a cutout or we're splitting, then we use lavender water. But we don't drench the bees in lavender water, we drench ourselves in lavender water. But the key thing is to be in a calm state, to actually almost become invisible with the bees. It's no good being near a hive on your phone talking about something else. You know, it's really being present. Bees are all about being present. Hygienic behaviour. I just love it. You know, early spring, you'll see them bringing out any um, deformed wings or any bees that are not fit. They'll bring them out at the beginning of the season. So you, we must encourage that. And the bees want to do that. And here we go. This is a bee gym underneath um, the entrance to a hive. And so the bees coming out of the hive, having a good scratch and itch, um, and then going back in again. And then what I had found is when... Um, I'd be moving bees around on an old WBC hive, the bees had propolized the bee gym to the base of the floor, the base of the mesh floor. So they didn't want it sliding around when they're having a good scratch. Pseudo scorpions, absolutely amazing. Let's bring them back, but we need the environment. So we're experimenting at the newt with solid floors, we're putting straw in, we're just practicing with the crud, we're practicing with mesh floors, and we're just seeing what happens. I've yet to see a pseudo scorpion, but I'm optimistic. You know, these things take time. And then this is um, a wild colony from a tree that we had to rescue in end of August last year, where it was a big old oak tree and uh, half the tree came apart and it exposed this colony. Now, the reason I've got this, I was just having this sort of wondering about wax moth, because I know you can use treatment for wax moth and we think of wax moth as being like awful. Now, I've had the experience where I've had colonies in out apiaries where the wasp has got them, they've died, and then the wax moth, if you leave it too long, the wax moth come in and it's a right old mess. So I've left it, God, because it was horrible weather and it was a mess and there was no other bees there, so I thought, right, I'll leave it. Come back in the spring, it's all tidy, it's all fine, ready for a swarm. And then when you get this information that you're meant to manage wax moth, you're meant to kill them, and I've noticed with colonies, they'll have wax moth around the edges, but they don't seem to do any harm. And I thought, what happens in the wild? And then I read somewhere that what happens is the bees will move off an old piece of comb, they'll let the wax moth clean it up, and then they can put new comb. Now this is as, as long as living memory, there's been a colony in this tree, and the family in this house, in this estate, have been there 70 years, and they've always known a bees there. When it came apart, we were up on a cherry picker, it's all fresh comb. How would they have fresh comb? if they hadn't allowed the wax moth to move it. So there's so much we still don't know. There's so much we still want to learn. There must be a reason why wax moths live with bees and why bees enable the wax moths there. If the bees didn't want the wax moths, then I'm sure they'd be kicking them out. So we need to plant for our bees. We need more of the native species. Think about your hedgerows and try and save the hedgerows near you. Think, have you got an acre's worth of plants for each colony that you've got? And if you haven't, make sure the farmers need you, near you, make sure the, um, the gardeners, the garden centres, everybody around is aware that you need one acre per colony of bees. So there's lots of ways you can help bees. So I know there are some beginner beekeepers here or people that want to start keeping bees. You don't have to have bees to save the bees. The number one thing you can do, which will change the world, and if you are a beekeeper, you should be doing this anyway, it's you buy, eat, and you grow organic or chemical-free food. It's no point sending petitions to governments. There's only 300 governments in the world. They're all very well funded, thank you very much. And <laughs> what really makes the difference is if we stop buying food that is not in alignment with what we want. 
As long as we keep buying chemically grown food, they'll keep growing it. So if you really want to make a difference, stop buying chemicals in your food. Stop using chemicals. You know, it has an effect. How could we be poisoning bees who are pollinating our apples and not poisoning ourselves if we're eating those apples? The chemicals, where do they go? There's no such place as a way. Everything we put on this planet stays here and it comes back up in our water or in our plants or in our food. So educate yourself and others. Share what you've learned, share what you experience and make sure that more people are aware because now more than ever, more and more people are wanting to know about bees. They just know we need to know about bees. The interesting thing is the Buddhist monks in Bhutan believe the highest level of reincarnation is as a bee. So they are seeing the bees as the ancient lamas that are coming back to us and telling us what we need to do. In the Quran as well, um, God gave the wisdom to the bee and the bee is sharing that wisdom. So it's so important that we listen and learn from the bees and we're the front line with bees. So it's the power of your pound. Where you spend your pound really changes the world. 300 governments, 7 billion of us, nearly 8 billion. So, you know, think about where you're going to spend your money. So what we do, we offer consultancy, um, connect, so I work with honey farmers if they want to transition from chemicals to chemical free and sugar free for their honey production, because I'd love to have pure honey around the world. Um, honey sensory analysis, and I do an online naturopathic beekeeping course. So if you're not in Somerset, but you want to know about naturopathic beekeeping, then we do it all online. How clever are we? <laughs> you can actually take a picture of that and that will take you straight to the website. Um, and my ladies down here, if you want to have any more information about the course, then just come and see us. So on the naturopathic beekeeping course, we start from basics. So we talk about all the different hives, um, how to transition, so if you are a conventional beekeeper and you just feel uncomfortable, you don't feel you're transparent enough, you want to move, come on the course. I go through care management disease, all the diseases, because if you are going treatment free, you can't be stupid. You've really got to know your diseases, you've got to know what to look for. Because if once you take that path, you're putting your head above the parapet and you're going to have a lot of criticism. But also you need to know your bees, you need to know what you're looking for, you need to know whether your bees are sick or healthy. So being treatment free is not being completely woo woo and just not doing anything. It's really knowing your bees, it's really being conscious about how you're looking after them. So you're going to get, if you, if you join my course today, you're going to get all these special bonuses. You'll get to do the skep making course for free which as well is online. And I've got my books here, Bees in Bhutan, and you'll all get a free signed copy today if you, um, if you get the course. And there you go. Thank you very much.